Hello, this is video lecture number 66. Today we are talking about the political earthquakes of the 1890s. Uh, for our subsections today, we have Depression and Reaction, Democrats in the Solid South, the election of 1896 and its aftermath, and finally, the courts reject reform. So from time to time, American politics enters a period of crisis, uh, during which politics as usual gives way to intense controversy over issues of national significance. Thus deepening sectional conflict during the 1850s gave birth to the Republican Party, which went on to win the presidency in 1860 with momentous consequences. Similarly, during the 1890s, issues arising out of economic hard times further defined politics, again to the advantage of the GOP. For a number of years after the end of Reconstruction in 1877, uh, Southern race relations and politics retained some measure of fluidity. Even though blacks were still subordinated and segregation was widespread, not until the late 1880s and especially in the 1890s uh, did de jure segregation, segregation in law, become the rule. Meanwhile, through the 1880s, Republicans managed to remain competitive in a few former Confederate states and a number of congressional districts. It was this surviving competitiveness and the closeness of the national political balance that prompted congressional Republicans to seek a federal elections law in 1890 to protect Southern supporters and the GOP from Democratic fraud. African Americans, though badly weakened by the collapse of Republican state governments as Reconstruction waned, uh, still won a few victories within largely black districts. Independents, such as Virginia's readjusters, uh, challenged the Democrats during the 1880s, uh, likewise the populists during the 1890s, both sometimes with success, uh, especially where they gained biracial support and cooperated with the Republicans. Okay, so let's have a closer look then at these political earthquakes, starting with the first section, Depression and Reaction. For Americans who had lived through the terrible 1870s, uh, the Depression looked grimly familiar. Even fresher in the public mind were recent labor uprisings, including the 1886 Haymarket bombing and the 1892 showdown at Homestead, uh, followed during the Depression's first year by a massive Pennsylvania coal strike and a Pullman railroad boycott that ended with bloody clashes between angry crowds and the United States Army. In the summer of 1894, another protest jolted Americans. Radical reformer Jacob Coxey of Ohio proposed that the U.S. government hire the unemployed to fix the nation's roads. In 1894, he organized jobless men to carry out a peaceful march to Washington to appeal for the program. President Cleveland uh, was out of step with his party on a major issue, expansion of federal coinage to include silver as well as gold coinage. Advocates of free silver free because under this plan the U.S. Mint would not charge a fee for minting silver coins, uh, believed the policy would expand the U.S. money supply, uh, encourage borrowing, and stimulate industry. But Cleveland was a firm advocate of the gold standard. He believed the money supply should not be expanded, but instead closely tied to the nation's reserves of gold. On election day, large numbers of voters chose the Republicans, who promised to support business, put down social unrest, and bring back prosperity. In western states, where populists had won power, voters turned them out of office. In the Midwest and Mid-Atlantic states, voters handed the Democrats crushing defeats. In the next congressional session, then, uh, Republicans controlled the House by a margin of 245 to 105. The election set the pattern for 16 years of Republican dominance in national politics. All right, our next subsection, Democrats in the Solid South. In the South, the only region where Democrats gained strength in the 1890s, uh, the People's Party met defeat for distinctive reasons. After the rollback of Reconstruction, uh, while some states adopted poll taxes and other measures to limit voting, African Americans had continued to vote 
in significant numbers in many areas. As long as Democrats competed for, and sometimes bought, black votes, the possibility remained that other parties could win their loyalty. As ex-Confederates had done during Reconstruction, Democrats struck back, uh, calling themselves the white man's party and denouncing populists for promoting, quote, Negro rule. From Georgia to Texas, many white farmers, tenants, and wage earners ignored such appeals and continued to support populism. Now, having suppressed the political revolt, Democrats vowed that white supremacy was non-negotiable, but they looked for new ways to enforce it. As early as 1890, a state constitutional convention in Mississippi adopted a key innovation, an understanding clause uh, that required would-be voters to interpret a clause of the state constitution, with local Democratic officials deciding who met the standard. After the populist uprising, uh, anti-voting measures spread to other southern states. Louisiana's grandfather clause, uh, which denied the vote to any man whose grandfather in slavery days had been unable to vote, was struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court. But in Williams v. Mississippi in 1898, the court allowed poll taxes and literacy tests to stand. By 1908, every southern state had adopted such measures. In most of the South, voter turnout plunged uh, from above 70% to 34% or even lower. Not only blacks, but also many poor whites ceased to vote. Segregation laws proliferated, uh, barring blacks not only from white schools and railroad cars, but also from hotels, parks, and public drinking fountains. Lynching of African Americans increasingly occurred even in broad daylight. All right, so let's look at the election of 1896 and its aftermath. After their crushing defeats outside the South, in 1894, Democrats astonished the country by embracing parts of the agrarian labor program in the presidential election of 1896. They nominated young free silver advocate William Jennings Bryan of Nebraska, who sealed his nomination with a passionate defense of farmers and an attack on the gold standard. Populists, reeling from their recent defeats, endorsed Bryan for president. But their power was waning. Uh, Bryan ignored them, running as a straight Democrat without ever acknowledging the People's Party nomination. The populists never recovered from their defeats in 1894 or from the Democrats' ruthless opposition in the South. By 1900, the party largely faded away. Agrarian voters pursued their reform efforts elsewhere, uh, particularly through the newly energized Bryan wing of the Democrats. Now, the Republicans' brilliant manager, Ohio manufacturer Mark Hanna, uh, orchestrated an unprecedented fundraising campaign for McKinley in 1896 among corporate leaders. Uh, Republicans denounced Bryan's supporters as revolutionary and anarchistic. Under Hannah's guidance, the party backed away from moral issues such as the prohibition of liquor and reached out to invite new immigrants to vote with them. McKinley won handily uh, with 271 electoral votes to Bryan's 176. Nationwide, as in the South, the 1894 to 96 realignment prompted a wave of political changes, but they were the kind of reforms that excluded voters rather than enhancing democracy. Major party leaders worked to shut out future threats from new movements like the populists. As in the South, many northern states then imposed literacy tests and restrictions on voting by new immigrants. In the wake of such laws, voter turnout declined. In all parts of the United States, the electorate became more narrowly based, uh, native-born, and wealthier. Both major parties increasingly turned to the direct primary then, asking voters, rather than party leaders, to choose their party's nominees. Another measure that then enhanced Democratic participation was the 17th Amendment to the Constitution uh, in 1913. 
uh, which required that U.S. Senators no longer be chosen by the state legislatures, uh, but by popular vote. Uh, though many states had already adopted the practice, southern states had resisted, uh, since Democrats feared that it might give more power to their political foes. Okay, on to our last section, the courts reject reform. While the major political parties restricted suffrage, uh, federal courts invalidated many of the regulatory laws that states had passed to protect workers and promote public welfare. As early as the case uh, in, in Ray Jacobs from 1885, uh, the New York State Court of Appeals struck down a public health law that prohibited cigar manufacturing in tenements, arguing that such regulation exceeded the state's police powers. In its landmark decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896, the Supreme Court put the nation's stamp of approval on racial discrimination. Advocates hoped to challenge the growing number of Southern Jim Crow laws, which segregated whites and blacks in hotels, trains, streetcars, and even cemeteries. Uh, the court ruled that such segregation did not violate the 14th Amendment as long as blacks had access to accommodations equal to those of whites. Okay, so that's it for today's video lecture. Um, go ahead and answer your review questions at this time and continue on with your work.